Thanks very much. Um, I'm glad to have a seat because um, I was a bit worried that I was going to have to do some handstands or uh, rope climbing there, and I haven't stood on my head uh, since I was 10, I think. Um, so what I'd like to do um, before opening up the discussion with uh, John Paul is just to give my overview of the thesis um, as, as I read it. Uh, just really in summary form, obviously, Jean-Paul's done that in a very uh, uh, energetic way, um, but, but this is really just my sense of, of how I read the thesis, and it's really just a quick overview. And it was very clear to me in reading the thesis that there were uh, clear research questions that, that started, uh, that, that kind of kick-started the thesis, and I'd like to return to those in discussion with Jean-Paul. But what's so distinctive about the thesis for me was its basis in two sorts of practice and the practices that, that Jean-Paul's just talked about in his presentation, circus and psychoanalysis. Um, and it's it's very dis it's it's very unusual to find circus um, work in academic uh, in the in the academic environment, which is so uh, based in the experience and knowledge of practice, but also one which is taking circus practitioners as its central subject um, and and on an individual basis, and that was very uh, striking about the thesis, um, and. It seems to me uh, quite unique as a thesis in that respect. Um, the study is very clear in setting out uh, a set of questions that revolve around the, the performing circus artist, as I, as I said, um, taking them not just as a subject, but I think as a subjectivity as well, and looking at um, them as both the subject um, and the objects of, of study. And I'd like to come back to those terms, subject and object, that, that Jean-Paul has just discussed. Um, so not as many studies do, taking the idea of circus as a whole, uh, the institution of the circus, or the art form, or the entertainment of the circus, but looking at the individual subjects who practice it. Um, so whereas those other sorts of studies that look at the circus as a whole, um, tend to look at circus history or circus aesthetics. And, and a lot of the work that I've read have focused on one or two, one, one or, or other of those. They tend to be a history of the circus, a cultural history, or looking at um, the aesthetic effects of this circus. But the goal of this study is to analyze in a very profound way, I think, the reasons why individual performers actually engage in this enormously punishing, I think Jean-Paul said, you know, masochistic. It's a very punishing and, and, and the, the, the challenges of the circus are also very dangerous. Um, to look at why people um, t it, it kind of go forth on this pathway and engage with this, uh, this way of life as it is, as much as a, a career or a vacation. Um, and in order to examine these individual histories, Jean-Paul uh, conducted a series of interviews and psychoanalysis sessions, um, which were very well documented in the thesis and which I enjoyed reading very much. And I, th I thought that they were very, it's a very difficult research area to be engaged in, actually delving into people's personal histories, they're unconscious, and it has to be dealt with very ethically and sensitively. And I did feel that that um, personal, it feels, it feels odd to call it for personal data, but, but in formal terms, that that was gathered um, very uh, thoughtfully and sensitively. Um, so that's the, the, those were the circus subjects of the, th the thesis. And the second strand of the methodology is was psychoanalysis. And I was impressed by the way Jean-Paul actually read very widely in psychoanalytic theory. And there are references, and there were references in the presentation to Freud, to Lacan, to Melanie Klein, and Winnicott. Um, and I felt he was drawing appropriately from those sources and using them to qualify and contextualize each other, set them off against each other. But um, the, ri the, the central reference point is Jacques Lacan, is the se central um, theoretical reference point, and it's Lacan's theories that provide the key terms and the concepts 
that drive the questions of the thesis. And I think that I felt that that I could see. You know, we'll maybe discuss that, but I could <coughs> I could see why that um, why Lacan was chosen because Lacan often informs investigations of of spectacle based art. You know, is very um, a dominant thinker in in film theory, and you know, I think Lacan's central concepts of the imaginary and the symbolic. Uh, provide a, an illuminating way of interrogating dramatic and visual scenes. Um, and, and, and in this instance, interrogating the demands that circulate between the performer and the audience and the circus itself. So what was distinctive about this thesis is that um, the psychoanalytic method is never deployed in a purely theoretical and academic way. As far as I understand it, Jean-Paul went through quite rigorous analysis himself and as an analysand, uh, directly engaged with the therapeutic process before um, uh, it conducting his analysis of, of the subjects of the thesis. Um, and I think that did seem to have quite an impact, uh, not just on his understanding of those circus subjects, but his understanding of psychoanalysis itself, and that that um, came through in his writing. Um, so much of the central part of the thesis is given over to quite detailed discussion of individual sessions, um, in individual case studies, I think they could be called, um, which which are all illustrative in relation to a series of different psychoanalytic categories: the hysteric, the masochist, the neurotic and discussions of perverse desires, some of which we've heard about in the in the previous presentation. Um, and from these comes a proposed practice of circoanalysis. And I think this is really the, the point of the, the thesis, is to, to imagine uh, a subsection of psychoanalysis that could be called circoanalysis and that would be um, useful in the practice of circus. Um, a, a, as a therapeutic practice, I think, but also maybe with, with other um, unintended outcomes. So the aim of this psychoanalytic practice is, is a therapeutic process that, that maybe, I think, might produce a new sort of circus as well, and I think that's what the final pages of the thesis are about. Um, not a kind of uh, therapeutic process that would cure everyone and um, of... of of their uh, hysteria, because uh, as Jean-Paul was saying, you know that would be if that were to happen, there would be no circus. I think it's um, uh, and and that wouldn't be consistent with the project of Lacanian uh, analysis itself, um, with the Lacanian understanding of human subjectivity, which is forever. You know, we are forever subject to the impossible demands of an imaginary other, and it's a question of how we deal with those demands. Um, so this this new kind of circus would offer a process through which individual performers could think critically and dynamically about their personal relationship to their performance um, and to the specific metaphors that they mobilize and engage with in their disciplines and through the labor of their performance, the extreme labor of their performance. And um, I think that there's a sense in which the relationship bet between circus and psychoanalysis is a kind of mutually imagined as a mutually enhancing one. Um, so I'd like to, that's my, my summary, I'd like to uh, um, kick off and, and just ask a few <coughs> questions and I understand that there'll be opportunities for other people to ask further questions as well. Um, and the first question is really just a, a general one um, that, that any viva might open with, which is, what was your starting question for this work? Where did you, what was your initial research question? And I imagine that changed as you worked, and, and if so, how and, and why? My initial, initial <coughs> research question for myself, was what was circus good for, in a slightly um, kind of negative way? Like, what is it? What does circus <coughs> actually do? And I and I realised that 
the research came out of my observation of circus practice and circus training, which was rote, which involved mimicry, which involved copying. Um, you know, uh, let's look to page three. This is handstand number three. Uh, do handstand number three. <coughs> and how circus students were m like more than willing to be to, 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 to see themselves in that image and allow themselves to be kind of stretched and bent and popped and cracked and and, and looking at and also very happy about it but uh, looking at it um, I, I could see I, yeah I didn't feel I didn't feel, feel so happy looking at that form of training so I wondered what it was what it would be like to hear from them rather than than, than just to tell them what to do well how would that shift um, and so I, I started to do some interviews before I started the, 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 the PhD. I started to do some interviews with people just to say what, what it was like and how they came to do circus. And then I remember one guy said, uh, oh wow, thanks a lot, that was just like circus therapy. And from there I thought, oh actually this is a bit like a psychoanalytic situation. And, and the people that came uh, kind of automatically just laid down on the couch. There happened to be a couch in the room. And so we just um, by accident set up this, this thing. Um, so my, my research question changed from what does circus do to, oh, who is circus? Who, who? And then that came, then I stumbled across, well, the subject, the subject of circus. And <coughs> um, obviously Lacan is, is the sort of central theorist, as I mentioned, and um, I had a sense of why you were going to Lacan, but what, what you, you were obviously, testing different waters conceptually. So what was it about Lacan that you felt worked in terms of the, the circus drama or the, the circus therapy process? Because I mean, you, d you do say at one point, um, I think it's page 55, I did not understand what he was saying, exciting though it seemed. And um, so there was obviously a problem with Lacan as well as some some potential Roots and answers there too. Yeah, there's um. <coughs> I'll first explain it really in a really non-intellectual, non-academic way. It turned Lacan turned me on. I, I I read the text. I didn't understand what was going on there, but there was something there for me. Certainly, I had a transference with the text. What are you talking about, guy? And and uh, the. I mean, Freud is very um, on the surface, very simple to read. It, anyone can read him. It's, he's very, he's such a good writer. Um, when you then read Lacan and then you go back to Freud, you go, my God, Freud. No, this is really complex, complex stuff. It's just that you're such a good storyteller that you make everything seem actually quite simple. <clears throat> and, and Lacan is just really difficult. And I think my attraction to the, the text, it's a little, bit reading like, a little bit like reading Deleuze sometimes or in Anti-Oedipus. Um, Deleuze and Guattari write that like a schizophrenic. You get into the strange rhythm of, a, of, of, a, of schizophrenic thought. And Lacan, in a way, um, he, writes, he writes like the unconscious. So you have to go on a journey with him, and it's not an, it's not an easy thing. But there were, there were insights in there. When I read about the death drive, when I read about uh, jouissance, which I hardly still know what that is, but and I, I read about the real, I read about these things that we cannot symbolize but which drive us, when I read about the drives, when I read about um, the thing, all these dramatic concepts that he that he brings up, um, I found my, I found myself thinking of circus. But for the first three years of the PhD, could find no way of using him, because I wrote the PhD so that circus artists, if they wanted, could actually uh, read it and relate it to their practice. So I thought, well, Lacan is not going to be of any use whatsoever, because he's so dense and complicated, and he's always changing his mind. Um, which is, you know, he's a thinker over a very long period, so obviously he <laughs> changes his mind. But yeah, but there were very, I, I just intuitively related to what was going on there without knowing why, mm. actually, actually. And it was only till I went into analysis myself right, so with a Lacanian that mm. I, this dense text became, oh, wow, really? Is that easy? You know, or certain passages at least. <laughs> That's fascinating. So actually was the point of, engagement with the practice and is it possible to describe what is there a kind of click or does that in itself 
because you think, well, if if there is a point at which you can understand that, why can't Lacan describe that? And you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so th so is it w is it something that you just feel and is actually quite difficult to put into language, or what? How does? Yep. Um, what <coughs> was the nature of that? Because there did seem to be a point at which you felt suddenly felt much more comfortable with what you were doing. Yeah. Uh, in a in a, in a Lacanian analysis. And uh, most of my friends who are an analysts, they're either Winnicottian, they're object relations. It's much more, I was about to say, cozy. Um, Lacanian analysis is really hard work. They, make, they really make you work. They don't give you much. And when they do give you something, it's really bloody obscure. I mean, it's really kind of, what? OK. Um, and I think it was that, and understanding the obscurity of the interpretations that I was given in analysis, that I went back to the text and went, Oh, I see what you're doing now. You're really, you are make, Lacan, you are making me work really, really hard to make this knowledge mine. Because the last thing Lacan wants to be is a master. Mm. The last thing he wants to be is the subject supposed to know. No, he takes you on a process so that you discover for yourself um, these issues. So, for example, the most difficult case study I had, which I suspected he was, <coughs> he was um, working within a perverse structure, the one where I was most incapable, useless, was with, um, was with perversion. I mean, I joked all my life how perverted I was and perv the perverse stuff that I do on the rope when I know I'm uh, hysteric. And those perversions are just fantasies of mine which I will never actually act out. Um, so in going through my own analysis, I'm, I'm much better equipped to work with hysterics and obsessives than I am working with people working in perverse structures or psychotic structures. So all I'm saying is, in, in, in working my own hysterical, neurotic, obsessive stuff out through analysis, when I go back to the Lacan's texts about hysteria and obsession, they become really clear. And the moment when this happened to me was when, um, to make, just make it super clear, um, I was talking about my, when my father had died, and this strange thing that happened after about maybe six or eight months, uh, when I kind of broke down, and I broke down because I suddenly realized I'd lost a metaphor. And I went to myself, that's weird. But I started to grieve like properly. I stopped being manic and melancholic uh, and started to be to grieve when I realized I'd lost a metaphor. So I said this in analysis, and she said, um, okay, John Paul, she's from New York, you spoke about your father. You said metaphor. And then she went, name of the father. And so I think she's leading me to the name of the father, which is a, a quite a central Lacanian concept. So I go back, I look in my dictionary of Lacanian concepts, Lacan for idiots, you know, which I, even I don't understand at that point, Lacan for idiots. Um, suddenly it was completely clear. I could relate this idea of a father as a metaphor back to myself, and then that led me on to psychosis, and then that led me on to foreclosure. That took me to perversion, and suddenly one little key opened up a big a big area of uh, of his mm. theories. So it was never. Um, and I was struck, uh, this is page 110, 11, and you say, you describe Lacan's ability to, this is a quotation, forever throw you off the scent. And, you know, just as you feel you're getting somewhere, everything turns upside down. And oh, there's something you feel you're trying, you, you can get to a definition, and then it just gets, you know, it's gone, it's out of your grasp. Um, and you said a Lacanian uh, an analyst um, w should conclude you should always defer a definitive meaning or knowledge in favor of keeping the analyzon working, which is what you're describing. But isn't there a sort of tension between that therapeutic process and the process of writing a thesis <laughs> where you do actually have to have a structure, you do <laughs> have to say what you mean, you do have to yeah. present a meaning to yeah. your audience was <coughs> that um, I is that attention in the thesis as well? <sighs> there's there's attention in the sense that you have to finish at some point. Mm. You have to stop, and uh <coughs> so I decided to stop at a certain point in Lacan's journey, mm -hmm. which is which is the ethics. I stopped at the ethics. There's a whole there's a whole chunk of stuff which really interests me and really involved my own therapy. Um, the, the real jouissance, the, the, the shift from the desire to do, to do, and the desire to, for knowledge, the desire to research, which means becoming, mm. becoming an analyst. Um, and I had to fix what I thought imaginary, symbolic, and real meant at a certain point. 
knowing that that wasn't good enough, knowing that I hadn't fully grasped his final works, which kind of seals the whole oeuvre up, um, which is you know disappointing, but um, either that or it was another 10 years in analysis. Mm. And, and mm. so I had to kind of fix. So I think in the thesis, they're rather, sh it's kind of that, it, th the way I use those terms is incomplete, but they're complete for the practice in a sense, c considering the, the, the circa therapy that I devised was f for maximum over three months, once a week. That was the maximum three or four months, maximum period. Um, so I had to, which is super short for an, uh, an analyst, an analysis which normally lasts, <coughs> can last up to 10 years, five times a week. I mean, gosh, I don't, can't imagine it, but. Um, so yeah, so, so it was the point of stopping and the point of saying, okay, no more, mm. no more reading, only, only what has come up in the, the discourse of the analysands, even if um, sexuality interests me hugely, it just didn't crop up. Mm. Hardly, hardly ever sexuality, which is surprising. It's kind of conspicuous for its absence. But I couldn't then, yes, yeah, so I couldn't go there. And is there something about circus, especially the kind of circus that you're interested in, that is also like that? That it, you know, that it's very difficult when we when we look at these performances to say this means something. That that, that the circus is always beyond your grasp as well, and that that you can't. Or what, you know, it's not mm. the kind of art form that has an ending, is mm. it? That's it's it's <coughs> kind of these um, explosive episodes mm. or intriguing episodes that, that yeah. you have to find a language for. So was yeah. that part of the, s the sort of symmetry there? Or yeah, no, precisely. Which is why I c I kind of give it this analogy with the symptom, and why mm. I, I certainly don't want to cure the symptom in it. And it's not a bad it's not a it's not a bad thing, but I think it's that you know this cleaner character that I keep on talking about, or mm. the postman, or the mermaid. Um, that is one attempt to give it some sort of meaning, but it's a, it's a metaphor that's laid over something that's already an incredibly powerful um, metaphor. Um, and if I take the registers of the imaginary, symbolic and real, the imaginary being this affective loop that I was talking about, if you imagine Wordsworth, the poet in nature, projecting onto nature his wonder and it coming back to him in this kind of loop, that's that's imaginary. That's that's the body. That's effective, and the symbolic being words and language and symbols. No, no not symbols. Words and language and metaphors and metonyms. Um, the circus is more imaginary, and that it actually hits momentarily on the real or gets close to the real. This real which we can't symbolize, which we can't translate into the symbolic, into, into words, into discourse, the one, the one thing that forever evades us. No wonder we keep on doing it. it. It's constantly slipping away from us. And the reticence, the reluctance of circus students to talk about it is, I think, because of that. Why should I have to talk about it when I just can do it? Um, and I think that the, the kind of talking cure in circus therapy is to get closer to the real rather than further away from it. It's not to cure. It's to get closer to that nugget that really, really, really turns you on. The kind of transgressive pleasure you get from this anxiety-provoking thing or the thing that gives you pain and pleasure at the same time. And you, you, you're compelled to do. You're compelled to turn up to the training space because this is where you're happy. There's an example very in the very first sessions that I did of a juggler who said, I juggle for four or five hours until I've juggled it out of me and I can then get on with other things like dot dot life. Mm. But he definitely juggles something out of him. Um, yeah, so there, there's a, a reticence to, to, to put it into words, to give mm. it a, a, a stop point. Yeah, I mean, I'm very interested in that idea of you, you getting people to put things into words as circus performers, because obviously circus, more than any other well, I suppose apart from mime, but you know, but it's kind of part of it. But it is such a m mute form. It it is a, a its language is the body, and you talk about that quite a lot. And so to mm. take something which is, uh, you've just referred to as the talking cure, and obviously it's not really a, a cure, as you've also said, but it is a talking therapy, and it's so much about getting people to articulate and verbalize things that you knew you were kind of dram dramatizing the difficulty of that. And I wonder if you could, I mean, is there something slightly perverse about putting together a talking cure with, with a form of uh, art which is so physical? And yeah. 
I'll give you, I'll give one one example. <clears throat> you know, the relief in therapy is that oh, I said it. You know, I fantasize about my dog. Oh, I've said it. There's a relief. There's a relief there. So there's one there's one guy. Let's call him Fred. <clears throat> the careers advice bureau. He goes to the careers advice bureau at school, and he says, "I want to be a circus artist." And she says to him, "You know, you'd be better off applying for a job at Kentucky Fried Chicken. You're more likely to have a stable. You know, I'd, I'd be." Um, it would be unethical for me to advise you to go to the circus. His mother laughs at him. His girlfriend thinks he's a wanker. His teacher thinks, laughs at him too. He thinks he's stupid. So this is the transference he's having with the audience. Because what he says to me is, that when I go and do my circus act, I'm saying, look who's laughing now. You know, I get paid more in an hour than you do in a week, my, you know, my ex-teacher. Um, it's a kind of revenge thing. But once it's actually spoken, and it's given a form in a word or in a set of ideas, then he knows what to do with it. Then he can realize, oh, okay, this is actually what, this is what I'm doing. And a symptom is the disassociation between an idea and an affect. Okay, you don't repress affects, you don't repress feelings, you repress ideas, representations. So what happens is you repress the idea, and the idea is his humiliations by all these people, but he he keeps the feeling, the affect. The affect will find its way through in his act. And what the therapy does is bring together the idea, the representation, in terms of words, back with the feeling, and he understands what he's doing. And then he has some choices afterwards. He's not compelled. So that's one instance where he, he, he gets some understanding via using words, which he might not have done mm. just, using, um, just using the body. Um, but I wonder as well whether, I think there was a point where you talked about someone you were having a session with and they did something with their body and I can't remember if it was a shrug or there was something and and you said, okay. I could read that because I'm also a circus artist. Mm. And I was very interested in that mm. la language, which I, w not being a circus mm. artist, even though, you know, if, even if I trained as a psychotherapist, mm. I wouldn't be able to read that in mm. the same way. And is, is there a way which psychoanalysis also has to be it also has to develop an interpretation ah, okay. of the body as well as okay. the you know what people yeah. say in a more conventional psychoanalytic uh, situation? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I don't think so. I think I was trying to be quite purist about it, mm. and there there might be another another way of reading psychoanalysis and then taking that into like a physical practice. But what happened was me and him were, were having this conversation and he found it very difficult to say anything. Uh, he didn't want to, see, he, didn't, he was resisting it. And uh, finally he goes, I'm asking, so what is the feeling? What, is, what do you want to, to do on stage? Uh, what, how do you want us to feel? And he was, he was there and getting frustrated. He just went, you know, it's just <sighs> he just did these things. And, and they went, oh, okay, okay, I get you, I, it affects me on a very physical level. This is why I don't go into mm -hmm. the space. What does this mean? <sighs> what does that mean? You want them to clutch their hearts? What, do you want them to give them a palpitation? What, I don't know what it, and he doesn't come back mm -hmm. to analysis. And that, that's fair enough. Analysis isn't for him. He needs to be in the studio. He needs to be still there with his body working that, that stuff through. Because it's not for everybody. You know, it really isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that it's probably not for I think it's for people who come to a crisis in their enjoyment. And he, he hadn't had a crisis yet. He was still loving it like so much. And it's, it's so enjoyable, the, the success you achieve with a trick and what starts to happen with your body and the admiration you get from other people and <laughs> what happens here to your self-image, all of that. There's so much enjoyment happening there. And it's only a bit later when you start doubting and questioning that I think analysis is, a, is useful. So that's interesting. So it's actually a, a more useful process the further you train. Is it? It's, are I you think saying so. it's it's more for people who've been in circus and are maybe you know kind of getting towards the end of what they're doing and and thinking about what it all meant? Is that or or and not so much because you do you do have sessions with quite young students as well and and they seem to be having things that they wanted to work through and there was a certain amount of success there but you're you're actually saying it's it's it uh, it could be applied differently at yes. different stages of training or yeah i mean it'll engagement. be it will be less difficult to get desire moving if you've been under the weight of the demands of circus for longer 
and you just want to. Uh, it's like uh, having a mother going nya, 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 nagging at you, and I right, I'm leaving. I'm getting my own apartment. I'm getting. I'm getting out. Um, it's um, you know this demand. This is where this demand comes from. This is uh, um, circus as, as as a demand. Um, but yes, I mean, th there were younger students who were ready, ready to, mm. to, to to go there um, with the with the talking mm. um, and had issues. Um, and as I say, the people who didn't who weren't ready just didn't just didn't come back. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this distinction that you talked about in your presentation between subject and object and talking about you, you say there is an object, an artifact of the circus. Um, and I wonder to what extent I, I suppose I had difficulty of conceiving of the circus as an object bec in this in the way that you know can any live form of art which involves bodies and performers and people to what extent can we think of it as an as an object and I suppose it's to do with you know the intimacy of circus that the subject and the object are are in a in a single body, aren't yes, they? Yes. You know, so the circus is the bodies of the performers. Yes. But you also talk about it as an object and an artifact. So how can that be? Because how can you separate the the body of the performer and their yes. subjectivity yes. when they perform? Surely yes. there's it's such an intimate Yes. Yeah, that's a great connection. question. <laughs> um, so for sure, the subject and object exist in the same moment. There's a mm. subject that produces an object, and so I'm not. <coughs> yes, a subject that produces an object, just in the same way that the ego is created as an object to do certain things, to perform certain tasks. Um, and let's say that the sailor on the, r the the character of the sailor on the rope is there to perform certain tasks. Mm. And the tricks, which I, ca I call them the objects of circus, are there to perform certain tasks. And I think the question perhaps that runs through is, does the subject disappear because those objects are created from the demands of circus? The circus mm -hmm. says, you, you have to make this, 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 and this in order to be a circus act. So I therefore deny my subjectivity in order to be this object that slots in. And in a sense, a, s a subject, because it's partly opaque, we don't know about our or origins absolutely. It's partly s unconscious, so we're never totally graspable, even to ourselves. We'll, we'll never fit. We're all non-fitting. Um, th that's, sl that's slightly what I mean. Um, and also, for me, the, the therapy was actually for the analysands to go through that process, for me to say, you are not an object. When you, when you turn up at the um, corporate event, and become an object for the glorification of Volvo, that is not who you are. You must keep your subjectivity when you are creating that thing for another thing, when you become an aesthetic extension mm. of a millionaire's status because you happen to be performing at their birthday party, <coughs> and you're performing a particular kind of act that you know is very particular. It has this order, and it builds in this, uh, this way, th this kind of trick. Um, that, for me, is definitely the object. Mm. The object for me is also the pliable, bendable, viable, viable object where the circus performer, artist, becomes stuff. And uh, in certain big companies, we don't mind if we break the stuff because we've got spares. That is also mm. uh, the way I use object. So that is a perverse position to take when you consciously decide to scrub out your subjectivity and leave that subjectivity to someone else's will. Um, but, yeah. but in making that distinction between the subject and the object, aren't you always allowing for the possibility of that subject to escape commodification? Because that, that, I suppose that was my next question. You, you, you talk about the dangers of circus artists getting involved in um, you know, corporate activity and that, that they're being commodified. And I think y you say they, they become a mere, a mere reflection of whatever it happens to be endorsing mm. um, and not being for itself, that, that the performer is not being for themselves when they're in that performance space. And yet, I think what you're, y you've just said as well is that there 
there is always a way of not fitting into that objectification. The circus yes. artist has yes. always got a space in which yes. they're somewhere else yes. for themselves. Yes. And so even if you were performing at the Volvo anniversary, there's always a bit of you that might be for your own pleasure or yes. might be investing in yes. something which had a future Yes, pleasure. other than that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, no, I, no, I, I agree. Um, but I think it's, I, for example, I knew a lot of artists who um, try to try to do this, the two at the same time. So mm. a lot of corporate events and then trying to squeeze in their artistic work or even the corporate events were funding their artistic work, but then never having enough energy left or even soul, they would say. It sucks it so much out of me to be this gurning, pretty, whatever spectacular thing that I just really I just mm. I just want to do I the last thing I want to do is circus and it was just a way of I think this this process was um the people okay so the people now who come up to me and go I could do with some circo therapy are the people who've been at it for a while and have done have done that circus and think to themselves done that circuit not mm. that, that circus have done that circuit and go what about me actually mm. because um yeah I think it's, no, that probably doesn't answer so they're question. They're, they're, well, they're sort of looking for ways of performing that the corporation doesn't understand. Is that, that's part, potentially yeah. part of the... And, uh, and yeah. maybe what circus doesn't understand. Mm. So we go mm. even broader to say, what does circus want as a market? Because we, th actually this thing I made here, I thought, wh what's the impetus apart from the content? Okay, it's to make an unsellable act. Not an unsellable act, but an act that I've got, I don't care whether it's sold, I'm not making it to be sold so I kind of free myself up from the demands of the circus, not just the circus but actually the market mm. I don't know I don't know who's going to buy that but I don't care <laughs> I don't, want, I don't mm. want it to be bought um, so it's trying to give trying to say to circus people that is a that is an option mm. that actually the market as a as a demanding force that you know there's no other behind the other of the market to validate the market just as God exists and then there's no God to validate God it's, it has to stop somewhere so unless you call the market God, it means you have absolutely no power. So, and so that shouldn't prevent you from, from doing more, uh, more mm. risky, t taking more risks. Mm. So I think I hope that this process allows people to get free from the weight of demand and say, oh, what do, what do, I, actually, what do I, I actually desire? Mm. Like, what do I want to do? Gosh, okay. Okay, this maybe. I want to do a 23-minute act where I do hardly anything. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I really want to do. Mm. Um, and that's that's what psychotherapy will support. Mm -hmm. um, I was also interested in the way that you referred to the need to dis dis distinguish between circus and the circus. And mm. um, quite early on, you make mm. that distinction. I wondered if you could say um, a bit more about that. It seems to be connected to the diversification of, of circus yeah. and, w and where it appears now. But Yeah. Um, <coughs> I mean, so the circus would be the circus with a capital C. It responds to Lacan's big other. Um, and uh, we, as circus artists, we reflect ourselves in the mirror of circus so that it, it validates us. So, oh yes, this is, this is circus. Uh, <coughs> likewise, an audience can become a, a circus audience with a big capital C and we reflect ourselves in your applause or your whatever it is to, to validate us as circus performers. Um, but, when I say, when I, but then when I say circus, I talk about circus practice which is taken out of, out of that. So for example, um, there are various practices that have emerged historically out of the circus. So we have juggling, acrobatics, rope, trapeze, teeter board, German wheel, all these things, Chinese pole. Have, they have emerged out of circus as practices and they constitute the circus. But you could take the word the circus, you could take the word circus away and still have a practice of manipulating balls or turning in a wheel that did not need to be conditioned by the concept of circus. So in psychotherapy, it's, I, one has to make it very clear whether you're here to cure, cure yourselves of the demands of circus but not its practices or whether you really want to follow the demands of circus. And in that case, psychotherapy probably isn't for you. Then you need, need to go and train more or get another trainer or get better trainers to get you to the standard of the circus. Mm. I, that, I hope that makes clear the difference. Yeah, and I'm just interested in the relationship between 
the two, because you said, um, or you suggest that the circus made a shift to interdisciplinarity, as but you suggest as part of its survival, as though the circus needed to diversify and, and discover other venues and other arenas um, as a way of almost kind of keeping up or surviving. Um, but I wonder whether it's also a kind of two-way street that the ballet also needs the circus, the theatre mm. needs the circus, commercial art mm. needs the circus, that there's a sort of way in which circus is also being enriched by its engagement with, and, and vice versa, that the, you know, that we can think of lots of examples of operas that, that are using yep. circus sets and circus performers. Um, yeah, okay. So that the, the personnel has really changed and yes. broadened in, in a way w with that distinction, hasn't it, uh, <coughs> as well? For example, the students that will graduate next year from, from here in, on the degree, mm. they, they will have much more opportunities to work in a variety of situations than I did mm. 20, 20 years ago. Um, it was kind of just starting there. But I think if, 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 you know, if, if I say this is about the subject of circus, I mean, I have to ask why circus to a, a student or a circoanalysand? Um, why this particular mode? Is there such a thing <laughs> you know, as a pure drive for the circus mm. as, a, as opposed to whether or not I introduce text into mm. it later or I decide to sing or I decide to do something else? Because the text, the song, or the theatre bits that accumulate on, onto this afterwards are all those coming from this central uh, kernel of, mm. of okay. circus. Um, do, do circus people have a particular drive that is different to the drive of the dancer or the opera singer? You know, and along with that drive, do they have a particular ethic that needs to be drawn out so that we present that ethic as opposed to presenting the ethic of the postman. The postman has his own ethic, let him have it. It's, it's valid over there when he's posting letters, but yeah, is there something very, I think that's, that so was what so I was So it's after. a sort of core discipline as opposed to a... Uh, yeah, that binds, uh, binds together all the mm. various disciplines that circus comprises of. What is, what is mm. the... You c um, and I think it, it relates to this term that you used that I really liked, which is the donation of knowledge, that each, each of these acts is a form of donated knowledge um, that's passed on down almost in the way that, uh, you know, a master builder or, you know, some form of physical um, craft is, is, is passed on. But I, l I was interested in the idea of donation in the context of what you're doing here in terms of circus therapy, because donation suggests selfless gift as opposed to curse or you know <laughs> uh, that you know you can actually donate something which has a lot of you know um <laughs> I guess, yeah. a, a lot a lot of uh, a burden yeah. you can donate a, a burden um and does does the circus knowledge is part of what you're doing kind of tackling that burden as well as or is it is that the wrong yes, kind of? Yes, I think yes, I think I use the word donation of knowledge in the sense in the that way that you know a father or a mother yes, passes on precisely, um, and the, pre all of the, pre these the precise goal of analysis <coughs> is to get away from that donation of the parents. Is to and the parents mm. want it more than anything else. Is that, is that the child uh, and the grown up and the adolescent actually makes their own decisions <coughs> about things? So, actually, yes, circus training, the actual, actual, actual training. Um, mimics that infantile experience of the donation. Mm. Here are the facts. You must copy the facts. This is bad. This is good. You must put, you know. Um, and I think the circotherapy aspect is to say, okay, yes, that is the, n the knowledge that has been donated to you, that has been given to you in circus. What about your own knowledge? So we do not want to see the repetition of that knowledge on stage. We want to see how the subject uses, those, that, uses that accumulation of, do of donated knowledge um, where is the subject in that? And mm -hmm. for me, the subject is in is in that choice. The reason they chose circus, mm -hmm. and sometimes the kind of accumulation of, of all this fantastic knowledge that you're just that you're just given and instructed into um, effaces that original decision, which could have been about humiliation, could have been about seduction, could have been about a, a lot of different things. So I'm just trying to bring bring that out mm. as a supplementary as a supplement to this very valid d donation of 
mm. physical knowledge. And I wonder, could it ever be absolutely disastrous to find out why you went into? <laughs> could could it be the end of the end of your engagement? Because you, mm. you, when you talk about the circus or circus acts as the description of a symptom, the circus is a description of certain psychoanalytic concepts in material space as symptoms, um, and you say that that circus. Um, is a symptom if you don't know why you're doing it. So cir psychoanalysis is about finding out why you're doing it. But what if you find out and then suddenly you don't want to do it anymore? Mm. Couldn't mm. it actually be the end of mm. practice? Because uh, I, I was interested in this idea that that by engaging with the symptom, you're sort of enlisting difficulty for yourself. You're, you're, there's a kind of friction and an energy that's productive and positive. But I wonder whether it, the re reverse could also be true, that it could yeah. it re result in a complete inertia yeah. and, and loss of interest. And is that, yeah. did that ever happen? Or is no, that it didn't happen, an outcome that you would foresee? Or It's something I grappled with a lot, actually, the possibility of, of, of someone saying, oh I, oh, I know why I do this now. Oh, no, I don't need to do it anymore. Yeah. And that's so not what I wanted. But um, there are people who come to me who say, I want to be cured. This is, there's nothing to do with the thesis, this is post or during the thesis when I tell them what I'm doing. And they're at a particular point where they say, no, I, I don't want to be cured, I want my, tr my practice to be transformed. <clears throat> because you go to analysis because you're stuck in a rut, aren't you? You're repeating the same things. Mm. Um, your pleasures aren't giving you so much pleasure anymore. Um, and you, you need, yeah, your practices need to be transformed. Your sexual practices, your addictive practices, whatever it, whatever it is. Um, I think in a way, I did, I cured myself. Now, when I, s I normally say, oh, I'm retired because I'm too old to do that, and that's not true. If I just, if I trained every day, if I could be bothered to train every day, then I'd still be at the peak of what I could do like four years ago. But I can't be bothered. This doesn't give me any pleasure anymore to do that training. So yes, I am mm -hmm. cured, and analysis was part of that cure. And in a way, I needed to <laughs> experience the morning mm like the very real grief of saying, okay, I'm never going to be that sexy ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to be able to exert that kind of power over people mm. ever again. That's, you know, um, and that was, and, I, and so I, I mourn so deeply for that, that I made this really depressing piece, mm. um, that I would not want to put someone else through that unless I was absolutely sure that they, they meant it, that mm. I want to transform my circus practice into visual art practice or into architectural practice and then I would help to mm -hmm. see whether that was really true whether they'd really had enough but they were still compelled mm. it was that it still scratched an itch for them um, but so certainly everyone in, in this study mm. uh, no that that wasn't close to the case except for one study uh, Liz who actually at the end of the three months working something through n not telling me what it was her predicament that she kept on talking about, not telling me what it was. Um, and she was a case which was, for me, very scary because um, she was so angry at the world in a, a quite a paranoid way. And the way she talked and the way she treated me was almost as if, um, essentially, I thought to myself, am I dealing with someone who's potentially psychotic? Potentially psychotic, you know, as in pre-break, um, which was scary for me. I suddenly thought maybe I should stop this right now oh, maybe the worst thing in the world is to stop this right now. I had to shift my orientation. Sorry, I'm going for a slight tangent. Mm. I had to shift my orientation to stop questioning, stop sparking off associative chains in her text, and to actually contain the situation and support whatever delusional metaphor she was creating on stage, which was a real metaphor for what she was experiencing in, um, in real life. And at the end of the day, she said, uh, OK, I'm not doing this piece. I want to be a man. Quite direct. Actually, all of this, all along, this is about me wanting to be a man. Um, so she kind of, she did approach the real, very real, via this very symbolic mm -hmm. elaboration of her piece again every week. Again, let's talk about your piece again. Da, da, da. Well, okay, why is that green? You know, and look at this. And da, 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 da. Um, so in a way, she w she realized that circus was kind of fake. 
The circus was a way of her having a mask so that she could be closer to what she wants to be. And I think she said recently to me that we'll see what happens when the gender reassignment is, is over. So basically, at the end of the therapy with me, she goes to a psychiatrist and says, right, come on, give it to me. I want to be a man. Let's, let's get on with this. Um, she says, if, if that happens, uh, then maybe I won't need circus anymore. Uh, you know, mm. actually, circus is pretty bullshit, <laughs> is what she's saying. Mm. So in that case, uh, yes, there was, a, there was an yeah. essence of cure there, because actually, she, she wasn't really approaching what her desire was. was but her. I also wonder whether, in some cases, because the circus is so dangerous and it's so... Uh, or s certain acts are, are are dangerous, and you're up high, and you're, it's about balance and taking risk. Whether um, whether actually there's a there's a danger in in complacency or calmness within that. That actually you could get to a point with psychotherapy where you weren't as able to gauge those. You know that 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 maybe it's some of the panic or the hysteria and think that that kind of keeps you up. It's mm. the masochism that mm. kind of keeps mm. you up, that stops you falling. That that the therapeutic mm. process might, in some ways, right. Right. produce mm. a, a, another kind of danger, which yes. is that that you wouldn't have that frenetic obsession with yeah. your with your symptom. I, I think I think yes. No, I I, I can see yeah. where where you're coming from there. But also let's let's take. Um, let's say masochism, in a way the therapy would be to say, okay, we both identify that there's a masochistic relationship happening here, but it's disguised because you haven't been aware that the transference, you're trying to evoke a, an aggressive counter-transference, perhaps from the audience. More, do it more. Mm. So control it and see how far you can push that. Um, and I think, that, I think it was more that, mm. to say let's actually discover what it, so if you're hysterical, if we've discovered that your relationship to the other is slightly hysterical, push it more. Mm. Come on, really can do it. Go for it. Be hysterical and mm. be the hysteric that is true to you, not the image mm. you think mm. of hysteria, but be what is true to you. And then the audience will be much clearer about what is being transmitted and transferred or donated as, as knowledge of the hysteric. Mm. And you'll be much more um, in control of that kind of, uh, you know, uh, let's say symptom Mm. and be able to push it mm -hmm. uh, further so you're not um yeah compelled yeah in that that you're compelling rather than <laughs> you're, you're being compelling compelled. rather yeah, than compelled yeah. perfect um i was interested in the idea of a circus unconscious that you talk about that there's a specifically kind of it circus unconscious and i and i wasn't in sure what that would be and I if what, what would you know how how could there be, be a circus unconscious as opposed to the, un the unconscious. The unconscious. <coughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll be completely honest or with you. Or an unconscious. Yeah. Voice. I haven't got a clue. Mm. To be completely honest. I think that, but I think w w where it comes from is that if on the surface, if the ego story of, if the ego story of the, um, of the circus is success, wonder, or beauty, spectacle, thrill, skill, technique, <coughs> blah, 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 not failing, then the circus unconscious is trauma, failure, anxiety, mm. masochism, seduction, fear, the nightmare version of the dream, like a flip side. Mm. Um, I, th I think that's what, that's what it contains. So in that sense, when we have an analysis sitting there talking very lucidly about their idea for their number and the ego, and I'm blah, blah, this is what I present, it's very clear. Uh, we look for the how the circus unconscious is popping up uh, through that to find so those is it dirty the stuff, the stuff of that un unconscious rather than the mechanism of the unconscious yes, itself? Yes, yes, it's the stuff. Yeah. The mechanism, I, th I, th mm. I would say, is completely correlative to mm. Lacan or Freud's idea of the unconscious. No, mm. it's, the, it's the stuff, it's the contents, okay. what I mean. Um, and another, which is a, a tangent really, but I was also interested in the way you talked about this being a therapy for new or contemporary circus as opposed to old circus. And you oh, okay. distinguish between the two at the beginning. And I, and I think I know why it applies to new circus rather than old, but I wondered if you could, I mean, I think it's sort of implicit in your thesis. I wondered yeah. if you could say a bit more about why 
yeah. you wouldn't see this as a <laughs> as something which you could take to one of the old old school circus families. Yeah, um, I think the the shift from old old circus, the shift from traditional circus to new circus is the shift where character starts to come in, theatre and dance and mime, film projection, mm -hmm. water. All these things start to set us layers and our chaos and blah blah. blah. <coughs> and now, and 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 obviously, in what I spoke to you earlier, I criticise this adoption of <laughs> these characters on top of something that's already incredibly potent. But then there's a shift to um, contemporary circus, recent, which happened, I would say, which became more explicit and actually published only recently. Mm. And we start to talk about contemporary circus uh, when I started. The project. So this is a shift that's happened while I've been researching, and it's that thing about not being fake mm. in contemporary. I don't want to be fake. I want to set things up. I can do all sorts of things, but I don't want to play anything other than myself. And I, and I think I say, you think that's easy? Mm. You think that's easier than playing a? Who are you then to play? Mm. So um, I I, th I think it's suitable for for that for the artist who is inquiring, who am I on on stage? Mm. And I guess. I was being unfair when I said it's not it's not appropriate for a traditional circus artist. A, cir a traditional circus artist still has transferences with an audience, um, but it's whether or not they're prepared to transform their craft. Mm. So I think I'm actually being unfair to say it's not it's not for them. Mm. That's being a bit I wondered if it was to do with choice and routes to the circus, because you talk mm. about um, the inve your investigations being directed towards getting people to think why they would choose circus, why you would leave, you know, the possible comforts of life in or, or career in this or that uh, for this very uh, rigorous training and which often takes you away from your life and, and family. And is it to do with that element of choice, which is much more dramatic and distinct in the new in the new circus than than in the old, where often it is about yeah. doing something because you've learnt the high wire from your yes, father okay. or your yeah. mother or um, and uh, but then that seems kind of fascinating as well that there yeah. there's there's maybe a kind of you know a, a different set of questions for because it is a often a family a very yeah. you know potentially fascinating family yeah. drama in yeah, those old yeah. circuses where the, where the fathers and the mothers are present yeah. in in the scene yeah. as it were. I mean we as trainers become fathers and mm. mothers. Yes. We donate yeah. the experience that we've had um, and that's wonderful. That's a really wonderful experience to donate. Especially if you've made a trick up. You've invented the trick and yeah, there's a certain point where you decide to give it to your student or mm. ask them to see if they can figure it out. It's very lovely. But yeah, no, I, I was very clear about why I was in the I had the choice and the weird moment in my life when I decided to go and train as a circus artist. Um, and there are, there are a few moments in here, and, and that informs what I made and the, the weird decisions that I made as a art circus artist. <coughs> and it informs why I'm here, sat here, right mm. now. Um, really, it really, really does. It makes so much sense that I should be using psychoanalysis now, um, considering of the, the reason why I kind of entered circus in the first place. <laughs> my supervisor's got a big grin on her face, because she knows what that is. Um, uh, but there's one example in here of of um, someone who had a, you know a car crash at the age of four at an intersection where everything got busted and she had a mach kind of a mach she walked around like Frankenstein for ages um, for because everything got broken and she says you know um, at least on the swing and trapeze the odds are better yeah. than that and that it would be a waste of what she had mm. won to not do that, even though she describes the swinging trapeze as puking up her soul uh, and being a place of voluntary torture, um, a, an, emotion, an emotionless void, um, et cetera, abject terror. These are words that she uses. But this is the trauma that she finds some sort of homeopathic way of dealing with you know, throughout her life. So her choice is very important. Mm. And she comes into therapy wanting to do the pretty circus thing. And very quickly, goes out the window and we get into this melancholic, masochistic journey into her life. And then she finally has the courage to, to do that. That's what she's wanted to do all along, but she thinks that won't be good enough. She thinks that that's not what circus wants, but that is why she is in the circus. So the idea of choice is very mm. important. Doesn't, it, doesn't always, it always doesn't always come out in those, dis those dialogues with people, but in hers, I think it did. Mm. Could we move on to this 
um, question that you dealt with in your presentation and you referred to one of your interviewees who talked about the audience as the geography which is easily ignored and you refer to the audience all the way through and it's this third kind of party in this triangular dynamic between the audience, the spectator and the circus as it were and yet you don't really critically engage with this geography yourself, do you? It's there and it's it's always being addressed in the thesis, but never analysed. And I wondered, is it just Im impossible? Did you think about engaging with spectators, audiences, oh, or <coughs> is, is, it, is it impossible to engage critically with the audience? Does it always have to be this imaginary other, as it were? In the yeah. In the in the dynamic, I did think it was impossible. I was going to start doing that. Mm. I mean, I had the, I was going to start to <coughs> really involve the trainers and teachers, and the audience. So I would have the th the three, uh, and but it that was too much. Mm. It wasn't impossible actually. I might have been a bit lazy, but it, 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 I wanted to actually really go into the subject and to actually open up the question of the mm. other, as opposed to critically delve into the other, because the other is is different for every every person. Because but it it's, would it s wouldn't be the would it still be the other if it, if it was your object of investigation would it not be the performer who was then the, the other would or then, yes would that the performer would, would that then be yeah but I, th I think it's I think it's a uh, it, I think it opens up I, I know why I, I like your question <laughs> it opens up um, I think a next phase of research mm. because I think once th this anxiety f of the other's demand or even the other's desire <coughs> has been overcome. Then, then, then a dialogue can start to happen, and then we might have something which is actually much more participatory. Here, it's not just me. You're not just passive objects receiving stuff that I'm throwing at you. Um, you become an, you become essential, rather than just in the dark. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I think that that could be the next step is for 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 us to critically engage with who the spectator who, is. Yes, who yeah. the spectator is, what they demand, whether we play we place demands on them that aren't actually true, mm. whether it's our demands. Because, yes, as you say, it's the imaginary other in us that is making the demands. It's not you particularly sitting there that has this demand on me. I just assume, and that's what we have to get over in analysis, mm. that there is no other. It's just the <laughs> uh, I I wanted to um, ask you about other theoretical perspectives, other methodologies, which you mention towards the end, other critical alliances, I think, that, that you that you chose not to pursue uh, in the thesis and, and with this focus on Lacan. Can, can you give me a sense of what they were and, wh and why they weren't appropriate? Or Yeah. <coughs> this idea of, of turning from an artist who has passions and opinions and beliefs and truths to shift to a researcher who's attempting some form of objectivity, um, some sort of distance from the, mm. the subject of inquiry. So the whole Marxist, Althusserian stuff, stuff, <laughs> um, critique of the ide ideology of circus and objectification within its feminist ramifications of objectification, um, I was just too passionate about it. And basically my thesis kept reading like a manifesto an artist's manifesto. Um, I thought it was brilliant until my supervisor was like, what <laughs> is this? <laughs> so I, I, I kind of had to, had to move away slightly from things which, were, which I was so really, really passionate about because um, it just it couldn't help but infect the text. And I want someone to read this and say, OK, look, oh, from A to B, he does this, rather than getting bombarded with hmm. this really, I'm really, I'm very passionate about this mm. idea of the circus artist as an object. Um, and not being an object, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there was uh, Heidegger. I got massively distracted by Heidegger, mm -hmm. um, running towards death, you know, th th these tools which are present to us because something about the world is already broken. Uh, quickly, uh, you know, this object here is very is ready for me. I just do this. I don't think about it. Its function is there already. Uh, unless it was broken, ah, and then suddenly it becomes very present to me, and then it becomes ready. No, sorry, it becomes present, 
I can I can rechange I can change its value or what it's for. So when I see a juggler um, with a pen or a toothbrush, immediately it's not a, it's not something to brush your teeth with. It's something to put in your nose and jug and it's so so there was that idea of of Heidegger how perhaps walking is somehow broken for the handstander. They have to go in their hands. Mm. There was that, and then there was the the realm of uh, ethics, and w and which goes mm. more into more depth into critically analysing who the other is and what purpose they are have they have. Mm. So those are things I had to leave behind, as well as my kind of passionate obsession with Deleuze and Guattari mm. and the work that they did you, you together. Like the very very difficult ones. <laughs> 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 um, I I was interested in. Um, the, the way you describe three of the female subjects of your work as hysterics, and I, th I was quite interested in that gender, that gendering, and that relationship between the term hysteria and the number of female subjects mm. who seem to emerge in your analysis as hysterics. And you say in the conclusion, um, or you refer to the tendency in psychoanalysis to use uncritical representations of gender. And I was just wondering whether this methodology you felt d was forcing you into certain kind of gender typing that you were mm. perhaps questioning or resistant mm. to, you know, yeah. uh, famously, yeah. I think you were citing Martha Nussbaum and her critique of psychoanalysis and it's, mm. it's kind of tendency to it's to the word i mean it's the word centralized gender yeah in a way. i mean i the mo what i most what i didn't like is is is, is the word and the, the association so just even to use the word i use the word hysteria more than i use the word hysteric mm -hmm. and i use the word perverse structure more than i use the word pervert because the use of the word pervert just sounds like a something derogatory when it's just a description of structure um at the end of my analysis, understanding that I'm hyster <laughs> that I'm hysterical, um, help me understand. I mean, help me understand a little bit about the three people who, the three women who come across as came across as hysteric. But the, the, the issue was is that their 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 issues were the two of them were their issues were very strongly with men, mm. and their issues were with an imbalance of male power within an institution. Um, and so that spark, and so this sparks something off in their discourses about <coughs> about men. Mm. Um, I could take away the word hysteric and still still look at the the um, the mechanism of what of of what of what they're doing. Um, and I mean, for me in Lacan, um, I prefer Lac Lacan's version of hysteria rather than Freud's because Lacan's version of hysteria seems like the most productive symptom to have you know he says hysteria is the only um kind of structure that actually produces knowledge because hysteria is there to challenge knowledge H hysteria challenges the master who thinks he knows what he's talking about um so hysteria accounts for revolution it accounts for rebellion it accounts for the desire for change it accounts for an um a fight for autonomy and a fight for subjectivity um But essentially, more more women came to psychotherapy mm. than men. But generally, you didn't feel that that the the psychoanalytic kind of method that you were using was was offering you mm. kind of gender I, yeah. types that you. I was stuck. I no, I was stuck in gender types in terms of re reading the theory, and even in Lacan. I was wondering how Liz kind of maybe challenged some of that because obviously, as you said, she was a, uh, she was a tra transgender. Um, or in the process of tr being tr transgender yeah. at that point, did that was that did that open up particular questions about gender, or, or were there questions beyond that? Um, I think I, I'll be really honest. I mean, the question of gender was really. She looks like a man, by the way. I mean, she looks like a man. Just so to be clear, so um, the issue was the issue was always there as a possibility, even though she never said it until mm. the very last thing. Um, I must admit, I was too concerned with the possibility that I'd started something going that mm. would be a runaway train towards a psychotic break. So I was too concerned with providing a safe 
as possible an environment for all this toxicity and anger to come out to to think actually to mm -hmm. to question it it's something it's something very um unaddressed in the thesis i, I admit mm. i admit to that um you also refer to uh, psychoanalytic protocols, but you don't really list those. They're not part of the thesis. Um, and I was just wondering if you had ever felt the need to challenge those protocols or adapt them. Would there be something specific about psychoanalysis that might need new or revised protocols? W did did mm -hmm. they always feel appropriate? Mm -hmm. Um. When I introduce the idea of psychotherapy to students, the idea is that you know you don't come and talk to me about your mother. You don't come and talk to me about wetting the bed when you were a kid. You talk to me about circus <coughs> to give to make them feel safe that they can come in and really just feel comfortable talking just about circus. But obviously, they do talk about their mother. They do talk about their father. They do talk about boyfriends, and it does get to that point. So something that they were safe with in the beginning. Mm. Because they, they know that I'm going to use this material in the thesis under an assumed name. But it might be very clear in the you know, when people read it who, who they are. Um, so there's a, I think, I th I th I think you're right. I think you're, um, they're, being very, they're being very honest about material. So I asked all of them. I said, look, read, read what I've written about you. you know, <laughs> uh, do you still, are you still okay with me putting in a thesis? And they go, yes, I wouldn't be. Mm. I, w I wouldn't want someone reading that about me, but they were going, no, fine. Um, so I don't know. So I think that, that there, there could be something in the offer that says, yes, this, but you probably will talk about your mother and you probably will reach certain conclusions that um, you, might want, you might not want shared. So I think there, be, should be a, there probably should be a refining of those protocols. Mm. You know, much like Lacan's... Uh, the, the, the pass at the end where uh, analysands compare an, uh, analyses with each other. So it becomes actually public in front of anal an analysts to keep the process of psychoanalysis moving so it doesn't get dogmatized. It keeps on moving with mm -hmm. each new... Um, because, you know, each new circus unconscious that is opened up contributes to the bank of knowledge of circus, of the circus unconscious. Um, so, you know, if we're to make more circus analysts and not necessarily psycho an psychoanalysts, other forms of analysts, then that material needs to be mm. shared in, in, a, in appropriate ways. And that would include uh, a refinement of those. Developing protocols. those with, with yeah. other people. Um, and in your conclusion, you, you outline the possibility of a new, that, that psychoanalysis would actually change the circus or pr it would produce a new kind of circus, potentially, in which... And this is a quotation from, from the thesis. Circus subjects would be able to mourn the loss of circus, their significant and signifying other, their point, their point de cap... cap uh, I've spelt this wrongly in my text. I've put caption. I don't know if that's a Freudian yeah, slip. Or that's fine. Um, signaling the, the, the emergence of the new subject of the circus, the, the new subject of the circus, and the construction of new objects, artifacts, identities. And you, you claim that for this, one would need a new program and ethics or conceptual apparatuses arising from the individual uh, established um, an emerging an emerging practice that make up the s that would make up the circus rather than a reified apparatus that is the circus. And I was interested in that um, contrast or potential tension there between your focus on the individual, the individual subject, and yet the aim is a new circus, a new potentially collective right. art <coughs> form right. that would be presumably comprised of these new mm. sorts of individuals mm. or, or individuals had a n who had a new kind of insight. And I just wondered if, I is that potentially a, a, a tension in your method that you are focusing on through these very private uh, sessions and, and, and private investigations into individual histories, is there a tension between that and the communal art, which is the circus, which is almost always uh, yes. a collective? And yes. you know, what would happen if you had some people who'd benefited from this therapeutic practice, other people who didn't, how, c how would they work together yeah. or, you know? Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, you know, as the last couple of lines of my, <laughs> thesis 
the conclusion was the hardest thing to write because I'd, I'd knocked the artist out of me and I'd knocked the poetry out of me so severely that when it come to, came to write something inspiring, it was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't actually, I have no vision. <laughs> um, so I think what, but the vision of it, it is that we, we be, is that an individual becomes cured of circus and then goes forth and does something for themselves that is not kind of predicated by the circus um, and that that could be a, a really a, a variety of things so actually it's to it's to let go of the circus mm. altogether so that who knows what uh, these different satellite things will, will will do so I think if yeah so I, I haven't in, I haven't an intention to um, create a new vision of circus. That was the cr that was the intention at the beginning of the thesis right. when the artist was still strong in, in me, mm. and that's why I wrote manifestos. The mm. circus should be more melancholic and less this mm. and more that, and more Marxist and you know, more that, social yeah, and more political. There is a tension between mourning and leaving behind, and then the, pra the, the, the proposition that you're also creating something new and that those yeah. don't go together. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's I think in with them. Um, Elena and with with Liz, there are forms of there are forms of suicide. Mm. Liz, su in her in her piece, suicides the woman, so that she can think about more about moving on with a man. And, and mm. Elena suicides something else. Mm. Uh, de deals with grief in a in a different way and moves on. And this I'm dealing with grief in a so I can move on in a different way. Um, and I think the analysis just brings that person to that point of mourning. Mm. And then says, "Here's a choice now: mourn, mourn it, or, or stay with it. But make it your choice. Don't be compelled to, mm. or don't be don't be bullied. Actually, don't be bullied by circus. You you can you are allowed to leave any minute mm. and still have a, still have a practice and a viable practice." Thanks. I think that's actually on that note of okay. mourning, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where where I should probably leave my questions, and I should say. About 10 years ago, I had a job interview and I was working on circus at the time and doing and conducting research. And one of the questions was, how do you see the relationship between circus and psychoanalysis? And Mate. I was completely <laughs> stumped by the question at the time and I gave a terrible response, I think, and I didn't get the job. But if I'd read this thesis <laughs> at that point, I probably would have had a very different um, wow. career. Um, <laughs> but that's life. Um, so, uh, if that's okay, I'm just going to uh, summarize the what I see is the, the the merits of this thesis, and also um, point point to areas where where it where it might be taken further. I think, um, and and where there may be kind of gaps too. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I think. Um, Whereas you know all the other studies of the circus I've encountered concentrate on on history or aesthetics, looking at the circus from without rather than from within, um, this takes its its primary focus as as the individual circus performers and their own words. And I think there was something um, quite moving in those that central section of the thesis and reading. The, the own words of the, the subjects who were um, that, that Jean Paul engaged with. Um, and of course, you know, there have been lots of personal memoirs from circus performers who are talking about circus in their own words in a way. Um, but what this study does is to set those personal stories in a critical dialogue. And it's a, I think the, the central strength is its, its critical engagement with, um, it's, it's set up setting up a discussion um, with circus performers themselves, of, of allowing them not just to tell their stories, but to challenge those stories and to interrogate them. And as um, Jean-Paul was saying, I think at the beginning, uh, to force circus and circus performers to think about and to theorize what it is they do when they perform. And, and I think that's been a, a fascinating process to, to read about. Um, it also is genuinely, I think, engaged in initiating a new subcategory of, of Lacanian psychotherapy psychoanalysis, which um, might well constitute uh, a future circus practice within circus um, 
teaching and circus uh, institutions such as this one. And I think uh, circus performers could benefit from um, maybe, uh, as we discussed, at different stages and in different ways um, within their careers. Um, but I think the reason I was uh, found the work so convincing and um, was that it's been conducted by somebody um, who is from the inside, who uh, has enormous skill and experience in the practice of circus performance and, and circus teaching but who has also taken on the demands of Lacanian psychoanalysis and psychotherapy um, and become part of, uh, has become part of, that's become part of the learning process as well. Um, there were many points in the thesis where it was clear that, that John Paul's background in circus, his practical training pl played a, a key part in his ability to understand um, his subjects, but also in framing the questions that he put to those subjects and to be part of that, that critical dialogue with them and to help them, I think, interpret um, and, and think about what they were saying about themselves, sometimes at the level of the body as well as um, in linguistic language itself. Um, so I think that's the the strength of the, the the thesis is this unique and it seems to me it is sort of a bit unique at the moment this combination of 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 practice in psychotherapy and circus maybe that's also its flaw in that i can't really think of many other people um who have those um backgrounds who would actually be in a position to practice um the proposed uh, method, which is psychotherapy, it seems to me um, a, a valuable but a very, very specialised um, uh, potential application. Um, and it would certainly be a very long and hilly and specialised training process to be to come to the point where one could practice psychotherapy in the way that y that you have done and, and you've suggested doing through the thesis. But I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm not saying that to detract uh, from the thesis and its its potential impact on circus practice, but just, I suppose, it is pointing to an aspect of its originality. And maybe, as, as we discussed, there is uh, the, uh, our blind spot, an intentional blind spot, which is the 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 geography of the spectator and the audience, um, this third party um, that we, we discussed in the questions. Um, the audience and its demands clearly shape, uh, to a certain extent, the performing subject's relationship to their own performance, their own uh, pleasure in performance, and yet that that geography isn't interrogated. And I think it's probably right that that's, um, as you've said, an area for future research. It might be an area that, that you take the work um, towards um, uh, thinking through a, a more carefully calibrated sense of who individual spectating subjects are. Um, and uh, that's where I'll end my, my overview and um, pass back to Lena, um, and who I believe is going to invite further questions. So I'll start and see if someone from the evaluation committee would like to put some questions to John Paul. I have a few questions in my notebook. One concerns uh, the other, and I must admit that I enjoyed quite a lot to be the other during this morning's event. Uh, and I understand what you mean by the other when you speak about even the trainer, not only the audience, and this is obviously a, a tricky area, as you just mentioned, Helen. Uh, in the turn of the dissertation, you also speak about the circus the capital C as being the other. And later on there even appears a significant other. So my question is, is if the other is getting very large and very, uh, I mean, can everything that is, out, that is outside of the sub subject be the other? It's, <coughs> it's, a, it's a really good point. <coughs> the Lacanian other with a capital 
O, unfortunately designates more than one thing. So the Lacanian concept of the other designates language. So the system which we all have to use to relate by the other, the rubric under which we become subjects. The other also implies the law, and that's different, different still to language. Um, the law that um, says you can't, prohibition, so the castrating law. And the other is also the, the primary care caretakers, the mother and the father. So, so the other in, so the circus other can be, um, I place it like in the, in the law. So as you said, there's a triadic relationship sometimes between artist, circus, which contains us, and audience. Um, if I was going to be Oedipal about it, 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 the mother container of circus, um, you, I mean, you could shift that around. Um, where, where is the law? Where is the m other as container? And where is the kind of subject? Um, and you're absolutely right. I don't distinguish. I, I don't. I actually didn't put that in the thesis that these three le levels: language, law, and the, the parents who establish the other. Because, like in the mirror stage, when the baby looks at the mirror, Agaga sees sees him or herself and kind of makes some sort of connection in the imaginary, in the, in the specular thing of the mirror stage. He then, she looks back to the other for that relation to be validated. So we start to get a triangulated, we, we, we get this triangle here. Or there's a dyad of mother and infant, which is one of plenitude. And then we get the other that comes in, separates them, which is law, which is language, and which is the name of the father. So it's complex to have to draw them, to, to, to pull them all apart. And I, 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 sh I guess I imagine in the thesis it's hard to tell where I'm using what in relation to Lacan. But this is not an excuse. <laughs> there's, there's, a level of, oops, there's a level of complexity in Lacan that at one point I thought to myself, Oh, okay, this isn't a thesis about this isn't a thesis about Lacan. Actually, it's a thesis about circus and how I can use Lacan. So there were there was theoretical fineries which I had to kind of I had to make some blunt. I had to be blunt. I felt I had I had to be blunt for length. Um, is that an excuse? Maybe that's an excuse. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I just have a little uh, remark about. A passage which, uh, in which you are very honest. You bring up some oppositions uh, towards psychoanalysis as a science. There is Karl Popper who says, well, it's not falsifiable, so it cannot be a science. And there is Grunbaum saying, well, you always have the theory before you have the evidence. So how can that be a science? And you say, well, there is something to it, and then you leave it at that. You don't even mention them in the list of references, and they disappear. Maybe we should revive them just for a little yes. moment. <clears throat> yes, I am. Um, it's very true, I don't, do I? Um, I? I managed to return to Ricoeur, who says what kind of knowledge is psychoanalysis and, and lists the kind of um, the parameters of what psychoanalysis is as, a, as it, epistemologically you know it's a the sort of facts that we deal with in psychoanalysis are not the sort of facts that we deal with in scientific inquiry there's facts the facts that we what are called sci psychoanalytic facts are what you tell me in analysis and it has to be something that you can tell someone else uh, in words they have to be to do with a reality that is not this reality. It has to do with psychic reality, whether that's fantasy, hallucination, dream, symptom, desire. Um, so I think when I got to when I got to recur and the way he laid that out, maybe I was just too self-satisfied with with that. Um, but also that um, it's an interpretative procedure that psychoanalysis is. And it can just as well be called an art, because not only as everyone in this room a singularity who will have to be approached differently, so therefore you're, you are not repeatable. Every analyst is different. They, you know, they're not. 
they're not, they haven't been evacuated of everything personal in order to be analysts, to become blank slates. No, they have their particular otherness, which you as the analysand have to, have, have to deal with. Um, and I think at a certain point, having to get rid of the passion and the kind of uh, the, the poetic side of me, which is the natural side of me, and work in this, for me, kind of boring, <laughs> but, but mundane. I did this, and then I did this, oh, and then I did this. It's no mystery. You know, when you write a story, sometimes you put the end first and go, oh, and then you go back to the beginning. And I couldn't be kind of interesting like that at all. I had to be very kind of programmatic about it. Um, for, for me, that was, that was penance enough um, to, to be, try and be scientific than to, to keep on whipping myself about the, the, Freud, the Freud haters and keep on returning to them, who I found very interesting, by the way, and I, I get it, I totally get it. And at the end of the day, I went, yes, yeah, so what? <laughs> it's, um, it, this, is, this is an art form, this is artistic research, not scientific, but there are some things that, there are some kind of correlation points. But it's very true, I do just leave them alone after a certain point. Hi, thank Hi. you very much for your uh, presentation, which I think is very enlightening and um, wonderful in many ways. I just I have one question about um, something that, I don't think it's a blind spot, but there's something that to me was sort of latent throughout the thesis, but never quite articulated, and it has to do with power relations, which of course are incredibly important to psychoanalytic theory and practice, and not least in Lacan and also in many of the other theorists that you cite, like Butler, for example. Um, and it also seems to be a part of your starting point with the sort of self-determination, maybe, of the circus subject. And um, I, I would just like to hear your thoughts a little bit on that. Because it just sort of struck me as, of course, there's an immense dimension of, of power relations also in the question of transference of the psychoanalytic, sort of the ther therapeutic situation and so on. And, and was this something that you maybe considered and then thought was so intrinsic that you didn't want to spell it out? Or like, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. happened? It's in, no, great. <clears throat> um, Butler and Nussbaum, Althusser, Marx, they, they begin my project in power relations. <clears throat> he, even Nietzsche in terms of who, who, does the, who, who does the sign serve? I mean, this language, who does it serve? Does it serve us or does it serve some other entity who's more powerful than us that, you know? And it, and, it, and it comes back at the very end. Um, you know, I, uh, I think it was, I was too passionately engaged in, the, in this idea of, you know what, it didn't come through. You know, I, I felt it. You know, I can remember very clearly when my analyst asked me, you know, so what, do you, what are you doing when you do your circus act? And I went, well, um, I seduce you, I manipulate you, I trick you, I deceive you, I stun you, I keep you in your seat, I stop you from leaving, I amaze you. And she went, I, and there was more. And she went, and, and, and you came, came back again and again, night after night, you kept inviting me, you liked it. She said, John Paul, what kind of person does that? I mean, really, who, who does that? And that was a, quite a leading question in my analysis. And, uh, but that's my analysis. And there was a point where I really had to decide to get myself out of the text. Because there were more of these stories that I told here in, in my own personal stuff in the text. And it was, it was too problematic to have my voice in there as an artist having gone through this analysis. I don't think Lacan talks about his own analysis. I'm not sure Freud talks too much about his own analysis. But yeah, so certainly my, I'm super aware of the power that I have on stage completely aware of that. I'm completely aware of my, uh, my charm. I'm completely aware of it. And understanding how to shift from this artist to, in a way, this presenter, what, what that shift of power means. And the shift of power between artists and then becoming a um, therapist. Um, and I think it was just something I didn't have space for. And again, something I feel too much about, and, and that it didn't come up in the analysis discourses. And I think I had to be, at a certain point it was great actually, I had said, okay, I'm only gonna be, I'm only gonna discuss what comes up, um, even though power relations happen as a kind of a subtext, I think, for a lot of them. 
So maybe that is a slight, that is something I didn't draw, I could have drawn out, especially with the case of Liz. That's all, a, that's all a, well, quite frighteningly about power. Too much power, actually. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So then there's time if there are any questions from the audience, and I know that there are big potentiality for actually articulating corporeally <laughs> distributed questions in this auditorium, but we'll, we'll do them linguistically this time. Uh, anyone? Hi, thank you. As a practitioner pedagogue, um, uh, I spend a lot of time finding tools and uh, uh, tools to get circus people to understand that what they're doing is one thing, and we, us seeing who that is doing it um, is, they're two separate things, but that are combined. Is it possible to take circo analysis without having read the book? Would it be possible to do a light version that actually, um, because part of understanding who you are and how the audience is observing you, we're, I only teach it in the now. Right. But I don't actually go into, but who are you? Yes. And I do think that I, you kind of mentioned two ways that you thought this would be used. One is the fact of the more you understand who you are, the easier it is maybe to do your art or the easier to connect to your own art, which is what we're watching. And the second is, uh, how many jugglers have we met that, oh, well, how's your juggling process right now? Well, you know, it's not going so good. I don't feel it. And that there is this other process of the training, which um, the anthroposophs have it. You learn who you are through your actions. So by learning pottery, you learn, you're not learning pottery, you're learning who you are. But in circus, we don't actually go into who you are. That's not important as long as it works. But is it possible, like you were saying, I was just interested because you said, well, actually, you're the only one that can do this now. But is it possible to take the next step and actually have a web-based light version yes. that everyone goes and ticks through the boxes, but just to actually just get the processes going yeah. as opposed to, and is, so uh, concrete, is it possible to take w all this work you've done, Sorry? And it, uh, to make it into a concrete question, is it possible to take this work that you've done and the knowledge you've gained and actually Uh, find a way to use it in the training that w trainings that we are trying to do today in the circus uh, world. Yeah, <clears throat> the, this idea of the other really comes very late in 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 the research process. Um, it's my dis it's the it's one thing I can genuinely say I discovered doing this this process. Um, but the beginnings of the process have a whole range of kind of uh, questionnaires and uh, focus group material, you know, a set of processes and exercises that lead us to at least find this genealogy, genealogy of how circus came to be a choice for us and uh, why, we ch why we chose it, who we choose to do it. And that for me is a, is a, can be a good starting point. From that material that is generated out of those answers, that provides, that provides scenarios, scenes, characters, set designs. You know, I'm pretty sure that those things could st use, be starting points for other people then to take up their own idea of circus analysis. Because I understand the, bl the blind spot isn't it? the blind spot in this is for an exam for the panel is you know let's find a let's find someone who's a Lacanian psychotherapist and also an expert circus artist. Um, that's a bit. That's a bit difficult. Um, so I think what I wanted. I think it's possible to to read the thesis and then have those questions, and then use that as a starting point for your own practice of analysis, which may mine the might not have to be psychoanalytic or intellectual, or academic at all, but it might spark you off onto different roads. So there is there is some practical stuff that doesn't need me to be there. As a, you know, the therapist. Uh, so then I think that it's time to close the Viva Voce, the Disputation, the Public Defense, uh, dear thing has many names, and wish you welcome back 
at two o'clock or just a few minutes before so we can start at two o'clock. And we thank you, Helen Stoddard and John Paul Saccarini. <laughs>